time is it? Well, if my watch is right, that train's about due. Oh, I'm so excited, I can hardly wait. I wonder if he's changed much. Oh, I hope he isn't thinner. <laughs> With a couple of your home-cooked dinners under his belt, he won't be thin long. There's our son making his usual quiet entrance. Uh, maybe we should pretend we don't know him. Right on time. Yep. Sure be good to see Jim again. Well, the way you're growing, you'll probably not even recognize you. Hi, Jim. Hi. Jim, you look wonderful. Hi, Mom. That sea air must agree with you, son. It's great to be home. Hi, Tiger. I see you still have the Rolls Royce. Yeah, it rolls, and that's about all. <laughs> <laughs> well, men, anyone for one of Mom's home-cooked steak and apple pie dinners? Which I just happen to have for our returning hero. That's for me. I'll ride home with Bob, if you don't mind. You may need some help with the pushing. We'll follow along and pick up the pieces. By the way, Mom's been telling me in her letters about this rocket thing you've got going. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, we're pretty interested in it, and we've got a lot of plans. I'll tell you about it later on if you've got a few minutes. Sure. Surprise. We made it. Hey, that's Sally. Yeah. Hang on, I'll be right back. Hey, Sally. Hi. Hi, Jim. Your mom said you were coming home today. Where are you going? Downtown. Gee, I haven't seen you in a long time. You sure have changed. Have I? Oh, boy. How about this last piece of pie? Hmm? Oh, oh, no. Gee, Mom, I've had two already. You sure? I just don't know where I'd put it. All right, I'll save it for you for later. Fine. Or for you, honey. Okay, Mom. Hey, Jim. Yeah? You know, you were asking about the Rocket Club on the way home? Yeah. Well, we're having a meeting in the physics lab tonight with Mr. Jones. Do you want to come along? Or, uh, does Sally have you tied up tonight? Hey, watch this. No, tonight I'm free. Tomorrow night, no. But tonight, we go where you want. As a matter of fact, I did bring some material home that you and the guys in the Rocket Club might be interested in. Great, let's get with it. Would you get my hat and folder over there? Yeah, sure. Good night, Mom. Have a good time, dear. Dad? Come on, we're gonna be late. Bob. Drive carefully. And, uh, fellas, let's not stay out too late. Hmm? Don't worry, Dad, I'll watch it. Why don't we cut it a bit short tonight, fellas, since we have a guest? Jim is a former student of mine, and I might add, one of the better ones. Jim, I think by now you've seen pretty much what we do, with all the emphasis being placed on outer space. There are clubs like this all over the country. And as a science teacher, I think this is a very encouraging sign. I certainly agree with you, Mr. Jones. But as I've been sitting here, I've been thinking that with all of this emphasis on outer space, I wonder how many people give any thought to inner space. It has all the interest and challenge of outer space, and it's a lot closer to us. Hmm. Well, it sounds interesting, Jim. Why don't you come up here and tell us something about this uh, inner space? Well, all right.
I'm sure you all know that two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered by water. And until recently, just as in outer space, man didn't have any way really to explore this world of inner space, two-thirds of the Earth's surface covered by water. But now, just as we have rockets to begin exploring outer space, we have a vehicle to explore inner space, the nuclear submarine. As I mentioned to my brother Bob earlier this evening, I brought along some material I thought you might be interested in. Conventional submarines are limited in range and length of time they can stay submerged. And for this reason, they were never able to explore inner space to any great extent. But then man tapped a new source of energy, the atom. This made possible the nuclear submarine. And for the first time in history, man could go far enough, deep enough, and stay down long enough to explore this whole new world right here on our own Earth. The Nautilus, the first nuclear-powered submarine, made scientific history. The harnessing of the atom meant the end of dependence on surface oxygen. Submarines no longer needed to surface frequently. And that meant they could make all kinds of breakthroughs in undersea exploration. long before several nuclear ships made incredible voyages across the North Pole, under the ice. Triton sailed completely around the world along the same route which once saw the tiny wooden ships of Magellan's fleet. But the Triton went Magellan one better. She sailed completely around the world underwater and came home in 80 days, whereas Magellan took almost three years. And these are just the early adventures in inner space. We've still got worlds and worlds to discover. Lands as remote as Venus or Saturn hidden under tons of water for centuries. Well, I guess I've been getting a bit wound up in it, but it's been quite an experience for me so far. Yes? Jim, when did you first decide to go into submarines? Well, I guess it all started about three years ago. If you'd like, I'll give you an idea of how it happened. As I said, it all started about three years ago, when I was about to graduate from this very high school. As much as I wanted, I realized I wasn't going to be able to go on to college. What with the business reverses Dad had been having recently? Like you fellows, I was interested in science and had done pretty well in it. I had heard something about a nuclear power program the Navy had, and since I was looking for an opportunity to get into a field where a fellow with my interests could learn and advance, I thought I'd look into it. So I dropped around to the post office. I had a talk with the recruiter and told him I had heard about the Navy's nuclear program. I told him of my background and my interest in science, and he began to explain the details of the program to me. The more he talked, the more interested I became. A few days later, after I had time to think about it and made up my mind, I had the recruiter over to talk to Mom and Dad. I like the idea that Jim will be getting such wonderful technical training. Yes, Mr. Evans. With Jim's aptitude in the scientific field, which we can certainly see from his high school grades, I think the Navy's nuclear program would be ideal. But are you sure it's what you want to do, Jim? It's just what I want, Mom. Why, nuclear energy is the coming thing. And this way I can get in on the ground floor. 
I'll be getting the best practical education in the world. Not just textbook stuff. The Navy is actually using nuclear energy. Now. I'm sure I'll have a real future in this field, Mom. Sounds very good, son. Are you sure you can qualify? I'm going to do my best. Well, it's kind of up to you folks at this point. But with your permission, we'll find out. Well, we found out. And I qualified. I joined the Navy and went to boot camp. Later, I took my first step toward the thing I wanted most, the submarine service. I was interviewed by a classifier. Well, Evans, I see you're interested in submarines. That's right. You have a good score on your basic battery test. Do you have a specialty in mind that you're interested in? I've been thinking about machinist me. Uh, you have a high mechanical aptitude rating. This might be the very field for you. By the time boot camp ended, I had been accepted for submarine school. I knew there were many hurdles to cross. Ahead lay a long stretch of schooling before I could call myself a nuclear submariner. But I was on my way. needed ratings in the nuclear program, along with electrician mates and electronic technicians. That meant we would have excellent chances for advancement. types of machinery and equipment that drive and service submarines. After three months, graduation again, and orders. New London, and the Navy's famous submarine school. Submariners since the beginning of the submarine service. At these very piers, submarines had been fitted out for war patrols, filled with supplies, armaments, and torpedoes, so that they could carry the war to the enemy on his own home ground. I knew it would be quite a heritage to live up to. At New London, you study and study hard because there's a lot to learn. The Navy has come a long way from the days of wooden frigates and iron men. Today, it's radar, nuclear power, and electronics. But you still have to be tough physically, too. Since you're going to be an amphibious animal, you need to learn everything you can about this new environment in which you're going to exist. And the preparation is tops.
finally sea duty on my first boat. Not a nuclear boat yet, a conventional submarine. But it gave me my first taste of real salt spray. There's no feeling in the world like going to sea. The waves reaching to the horizon, the feeling of going places. That's the excitement of the sea, whether you sail an 18th century schooner or a conventional submarine like mine. Now, I could call myself a sailor. When I first started standing my engine room watches, I finally realized the reason for all those months of training and study. There's just no substitute for fine training. And I was ready thanks to the Navy. Later on, I stood watch at the diving planes as we took her down. Boy, if you think that isn't a thrill. And my shipmates were learning their specialties too. By the time I finished my first cruise, this was really my ship. And before long, I qualified for the emblem, which sets you apart in the Navy as a member of the silent service, the dolphins of a submariner, and in the process, the stripe of a third-class petty officer. And then the final phase of my training, nuclear power school. One year of the finest technical training that a guy could want. Math, physics, reactor principles, thermodynamics, these were just a few of the courses I took during the first six months. My textbooks were packed with the information scientists and scholars had spent years to discover. I realized I was getting a fabulous education about the world of the future. Thank you.
But the Navy doesn't depend on textbook theories alone. At work on the actual machines during the last six months in prototype school, all that hardware suddenly seemed to come alive. We were given problems which we might someday face at sea. Problems we'd be ready for when the time came. The training, the education, sea duty on a conventional sub, actual operations of nuclear machinery, all had prepared me for the moment no nuclear sailor can forget. The first glimpse of his own boat. Machinist mate Jim Evans reporting for duty, sir. As the days passed at sea, I began to feel more and more that I really belonged. And I think the Navy must have agreed, because I was promoted to second class. Sometimes there was horseplay and laughs, but there was a serious side too. So time goes on. The hours pass into days and days into weeks. By now, you're a full-fledged amphibious animal. And like any other amphibious animal, you must spend part of your life in the water, but you must also spend part of it on land. And what better way to spend it than in foreign ports, getting to know the customs of other people. but men must go down to the sea in ships. And for our ship, it was time to return again. Our ship had been called the ultimate weapon. Back to work in a world that's slowly but surely giving up more of its mysteries. A world that's the natural habitat for all submarines. Conventional, nuclear, and the FBM, the fleet ballistic missile submarine that's armed with the most formidable weapon yet devised for the defense of the free world. 
the Polaris missile, a triumph of American science, all packed into one weapon system that you can't even see. It's quite a life. You really are home, Jim Evans. Well, that's about how it happened, fellas. Jim, it's really encouraging to me as a teacher seeing one of my students going into a program like this. And it's wonderful that such opportunities do exist for young men like you. And in time for fellas like our group here this evening. That certainly opens up a whole new area that I never thought about before. That's right. Jim, what do you say we set up malts for these hungry rocketeers or hungry future submariners? Good idea. Hey, Jim. Yeah? You gonna have a submarine sandwich with your malt? <laughs> this was the story of one young man. We chose to call him Jim Evans. But Jim Evans is really many people. Your son, your brother, your cousin, your neighbor. Young men from all parts of this vast and wonderful nation of ours. It is these young men who are truly America's first line of defense, dedicated to the service of their nation and the cause of freedom throughout the world.